For your viewing pleasure, this broadcast of the Municipal Council Meeting of Alpena is made possible by the funding provided by the City of Alpena. Thank you for your generosity. Good evening. Welcome to the Alpena City Council meeting, May 16, 2016. Call the order, please. Johnson. Here. Nielsen. Here. Noah. Here. Sexton. Here. Wallagora. Here. Good to the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. 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 Modifications to the agenda this evening. I'd like to ask that uh, someone move to move uh, communications and petitions, Chief's Bar and Grill, up to uh, up to uh, right before the public hearings. So just prior to the I move to move up to the Before public hearings. Yeah, before public hearings. Nielsen? Yes. Nowak? Yes. Sexton? Yes. Wallagora? Aye. Johnson? Yes. Thank you. Uh, any other modifications to the agenda? Okay, approval of the minutes for regular session May 2nd, 2016. Any issues, corrections? Citizens appearing uh, before council on agenda and non-agenda items are allowed five minutes each to address your concerns. If you do so, please come to the podium to state your name and address for our records. This does not apply to anyone that is here for public comment for vacating either of the uh, alleys. That will be at a separate time. Well, I'll call you up when we get to that part of the agenda. Or open public comment about the city budget. We'll also have a, a separate public comment for that. But if anyone has any other topic they would like to um, discussed, please come to the podium. The consent agenda this evening is A, bills to be allowed in the amount of $162,099.30. I move we approve the consent agenda. Second. Just how many two? Noah? Yes. Sexton? Yes. Wallagora? Aye. Johnson? Yes. Nielsen? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, next up will be, uh, we'll skip down to Chief's Bar. Communication petitions. This is the uh, Chief's Bar and Guerrill uh, request to close Lake Street on June 4th, 11th, and July 30th, 2016, and approve a noise variance from 10 p.m. until 12 a.m. also requesting the closure of Lake Street every Wednesday from 6 till 10 p.m. for a cornhole week. Um, we'll handle those in two separate motions, I believe, as we did last year. Um, so uh, let's do the uh, let's do the um, request to uh, close the street on the 4th, 11th, and 30th, 4th and 11th of June. Um, July 30th, noise variance from 10 till uh, midnight. If there's any uh, discussion or issues with that, that's uh, the charities, uh, three charities. That's you know, certainly something we've done in the past for them, and they do good work charity wise. So. It's several neighbors write in and say that they were, they blessed it, so. Yeah, and I don't know how many years you've been doing that. I guess for everyone's... Uh, uh, about 10 years now, this will be, our, I believe, our ninth year. And that's Humane Society. Um, the Volleyball League. Volleyball and League. And also Relay for Life on the 30th. Mm -hmm. 
I move we approve the street closure for the 4th, 11th, and 30th and the noise ordinance variance. Second. Sexton? Yes. Wellagora? Aye. Johnson? Yes. Nielsen? Yes. Noah? Yes. Okay, and then the second part of the request was requesting to close Lake Street uh, every Wednesday. Uh, it says every Wednesday in here. It's every Wednesday Nine. from... Mm -hmm. From mid June through, but there, there are nine nine Wednesdays. Nine Wednesdays yes, from mid June, from starting mid June. Okay. Um, and that's from six to ten. Yes, and that is only the the uh, portion of the street that's adjacent to my bar. Okay. Everyone understands where that is. Mm -hmm. and, um, we had some comments from our uh, department heads. They're kind of split. Uh, um, also have. Three, three named um, neighbors that that's that sort of signed her. I guess that's a, uh, saying that they support the closure for that six to ten. Uh, I know this came up last year. Mm -hmm. um, my, uh, I guess my view would be to um, I would I'd like to see that that all of the neighbors have 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 given their blessing, so to speak, all of them on that street. It does say that two houses are vacant and two people weren't home. Because um, outside of that, I guess I would uh, I would kind of feel that, you know, it's asked a couple times, we haven't had a whole lot of opposition to it, to at least give it a try and see if see if it's, there's some uh, issues, if we get a lot of complaints. Um, I know that Joel and the, and the, um, and the Chief Forbush have, in the past, some issues with with safety. Do you feel that it's a big public safety issue, or no, not really? So that's where I'm at. I don't know where the rest of council is at on that topic. We discussed it, I think, at length last year. Well, I I tend to agree with the mayor in that you know it is a neighborhood grill. Grill. Sorry, it's not a grill. It's not a grill. <coughs> it is a neighborhood bar. So uh, you know a lot of those those residents frequent the bar. You know, it is pretty close knit community there, and I, I like to see them give it a shot. And if there's issues, then, then they won't do it again, probably. Um, but at least have the opportunity to, to get out there and do something fun and drum up some business on that end of town. And um, you know, I wouldn't have an issue waiting on the last two residents either. Um, I think if, if everybody there wants to do it and it's not an issue, let them give it a shot. And see what happens. I, just, I, I tend to agree, but Joel, do you see issues with this? From a public safety point of view, not particularly. I mean, I was probably more concerned about the fire vehicles being through. And honestly, if, if there's going to be a closure, they have to have uh, somebody there to man the barricades to open up in case we need to come through. That's just a given. You know, from a non law enforcement point of view, maybe on a tangent, I know that there are concerns about if we open up for one establishment, is it going to? Everybody else can want to jump on board. I know that was a concern last year. And so I held off my recommendations to see until I get the field council here. If the council wants to go ahead, I have no problem approving. Um, I support our local businesses, but I know that was an issue last year. Yeah. And I understand that too. Um, I guess being able to say that there's a comfortable saying that there's a huge difference between one block of Lake Street on the north side and shutting down a block of Chisholm Street on the south side. Yeah. Just in comparison Traffic. to where some of the Traffic. establishments are, or US 23. I mean, I know that they wouldn't even ask. That's not something we can do. So. Right. It would be nice to have some more activity. It would be more activity. Yeah, we, uh, uh, we're in, in the winter, we have pool leagues, uh, dart leagues, all in sight. In the summer, there's nothing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, uh, I got to keep my, my employees going all, all summer long, too. Well, I tend to agree with the rest of council. I just would like to keep it open-ended if we get a lot of complaints to let staff have the opportunity to come back and let us know that. Yeah. If, uh, yeah. yeah if, if, if you get a lot of complaints, I'll voluntarily shut that down. No, that's no problem. Yeah. Why don't we just? Why don't we? If if, if approved, let's make sure that we stay in a three-way uh, right. communication with uh, with Chief and the Police Department and Greg, obviously. 
We have to go down there every Wednesday and drink beer and check on you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's that's terrible. Terrible. <laughs> Someone would like to make that motion. And will we allow the uh, temporary closure from what, six to ten for nine Wednesdays for Chiefs? Or the dates that he has on his um, application for the LCC are June fifteenth through August tenth. So that's it. Okay. Just, you're not used to being up here. <laughs> that's what he said. <laughs> he said no. Second. Has written. Okay. Um, Walagora. Aye. Johnson. Yes. Nielsen. Yes. Nowak. Yes. Sexton. Yes. Schedule the agenda. Next up, we have public hearings. This is a request of Eric Stewart Properties LLC to have the city vacate a portion of an alley located between 9th and 10th Avenue uh, west of Chisholm Street. We'll start with a uh, I'll open the public hearing uh, report by the city planner Adam Paul, and then we'll get to uh, open public comment here shortly. I know that Rich uh, Sellinger also prepared a memo. Uh, he's not here tonight. Um, it's very brief, so I'll just uh, very quickly touch on his. Um, City of Alpena, he notes that has no water, sewer, or storm utilities running through the proposed alley. Um, Alpena Power Company has a utility line running along portions of this alley, um, and they, as well as I believe DVD, but he does have uh, letter responses from both of those companies. They say they support the uh, vacation as long as they can relocate those. Or use uh, as the alley debt, you know, as the alley debt ends into tenth, the access point, and with the other access points to those at the south end or vacant portion of the alley, there would appear to be no traffic related issues. And uh, he, you know, he perceives no issues with the proposed abandonment of the alley. So I'll just give you a little, uh, little backstory of how we got here, and uh, we'll go from there. Um, Thunder Bay Chrysler has been looking to expand their operations for some time. They were initially working with the city to acquire some property on US 23 North, but due to wetland issues, the property did not prove feasible for their needs. After the applicants purchased the former Mike's Hardware Building and received a special use permit to utilize that site for vehicular sales. Uh, um, then after that, they also submitted, submitted a brownfield plan, uh, which was approved by the city uh, with plans to build a second story on their building. For additional space. At this point, St. Anne's Catholic Church offered to sell them the existing uh, parking lot in exchange for assistance creating new parking areas for the church. The Planning Commission recently recommended approval of a rezone and special land use permit to allow for the expansion of the dealership to, uh, for the parking lot at 825 Lockwood Street. The rezone request will be brought to City Council in June for final approval. Thunder Bay Chrysler would now like to expand their building to the rear instead of adding a second story which would require vacating the public alley. As they own most of the block on both sides of the alley, uh, they have requested to vacate a majority of the alley. By adding onto the rear of their existing building, they can, they can obtain the size of the building they require for expanded operations at the present location. The vacate of the alley would not appear to have a negative impact on the area. The dealership owns the property on both sides of the, of the area proposed to be vacated. A small section of alley would remain public, uh, which would be which would be the section between Players Pub and Bliss Painting. Generally, staff prefers, prefers that if a vacate is going to occur, that we vacate an entire alley, as creating portions of an alley typically creates dead ends. In this instance, leaving the section of public alley between Players Pub and Bliss Painting um, would, would appear to be beneficial as, the alley, as if the alley is vacated, both Players and Bliss would have the option of obtaining their half of the, the alley along their property. If Bliss took this option, access to players could be restricted, which could be problematic. Um, staff would note the vacate of the alley could make it more difficult for large trucks to make, to make deliveries to players' fault, as it could potentially restrict the ability of large trucks to use the alley for deliveries without having to turn around. Staff believes that a solution to this, to this issue can be found. It would note there are a number of similar businesses throughout the city that do not have an alley that gives full through option for delivery trucks. If the vacate is not approved, the dealership can still acquire the parking lot from St. Anne's and utilize it for their business um, if the reason is approved by city council. Um, but they would have to look at different building options for their proposed location. 
They would either have to build an unattached building on their lot at 825 Lockwood, which would make operations difficult, or they'd have to build a second story on their existing dealership, the cost of which may not allow them to acquire the lot from the church. Uh, therefore, the vacate request would not appear to have a negative impact on the area, and Thunder Bay, it would allow Thunder Bay Chrysler to expand their operations. Um, staff would recommend approval of the vacate request. Um, all right, thank you, Adam. Uh, up next is uh, public comment um, for that, uh, for the vacation of that specific uh, alley. So I'll open it up to public comment. Anyone that would like to come, uh, please come to the podium and state your name and address for our records and make a comment. Okay, any written uh, comments received by the clerk's office? Yeah. <coughs> Okay, I'll close the public comment and open it up for council discussion. <coughs> Just had a quick question, I guess, for Greg. Mm -hmm. I would say Reg, but um, when we vacate, does that have any impact on our street funding at all? Or? Not, I do not believe so for alleys. No. questions it was pretty thoroughly covered I would appreciate that Adam I move we adopt resolution 2016-06 vacating a portion of the alley second Johnson yes Nielsen yes Nowak yes Sexton <coughs> yes Wallagora hi thank you next up is a request of Bishop Stephen J. Reka to have the city vacated portion of an alley located between Lockwood Street and Sobel Street. And I apologize if I screwed that last name up. I'm familiar with that. Um, first up is uh, to open the public hearing again. Uh, report by City Planning and Development Director Adam Paul. All right. All States Catholic Area uh, Parish has filed a request to vacate the section of Platted Alley between two vacant lots located at 903 Sobel Street. On Lockwood. They are requesting to construct a parking lot on the vacant lots and platted alley. The applicants intend to convey the existing intended to convey the existing parking lot they own at 825 Lockwood, located between the dealership and the existing church, to Thunder Bay Chrysler Jeep Dodge, to allow the dealership to expand the business. The church plans on constructing two additional parking areas that would allow them to make up for the space lost with the conveyance of the lot at 825 Lockwood and give them around 20 additional parking spaces. One of the proposed parking areas is located northwest of the existing church, directly across a set of existing railroad tracks. <coughs> the church owns two vacant, um, two vacant lots separated by a platted but never constructed alley. Uh, the applicants are asking for the city to vacate a portion of the alley between the vacant lots so they can utilize the space for parking. The alley in question is unique as it appears that it is Appears the platted, dead, the platted alley dead ends into the railroad easement. Originally, this was a platted alley uh, location. I'm sorry. Originally, this was a platted location for 10th Avenue, but only two blocks were constructed on the west side of Chisholm Street. The railroad owns an easement over the rest of platted 10th Avenue, and there is no approved access via a curb cut to 10th Avenue right away from this block. Due to the lack of approved access to in the 10th Avenue right away in the existing railroad easement at the location. Staff feels this effectively creates a dead end alley. Because the alley is effectively a dead end alley, staff feels that shortening the alley by 66 feet would not appear to have a negative impact on the area. There is evidence that some individuals have been driving through the existing vacant lots that are owned by the applicants uh, to access the alley. A few residents have indicated their objection to the proposed vacate, citing that there would be no through access to the alley via the vacant lots. As the lots are privately owned, the owners could have, um, could, can, could have and can construct a fence and effectively block the access that has been used at any time. In addition to the vacate request, various other approvals were required because the proposed parking area is, a res is in a residentially zoned area and separated from the church building by railroad tracks. They were required to attain a special permit. The Planning Commission held a public hearing for the request on May 10th and the request was approved 6-0. The Zoning Board of Appeals also approved a variance to allow the parking area, to allow the parking lot to be located 
five feet from a residential property line, and that variance was approved under April 27th meeting. Planning Commission and the Zoning Board of Appeals noted that the construction of, a park, um, of parking would provide a visual buffer between the residential neighborhood and existing railroad tracks, and that due to the presence of the railroad tracks, the lots were unlikely to be utilized for residential development in the future. If the vacate is approved, the applicants could construct the parking lot as designed and, and the associated fence. Um, if the vacate is denied, the applicants could still construct the parking lot as it has been approved by the Planning Commission and Zoning Board of Appeals, but they would have to submit a new design that, that would lose um, at least four to six parking spaces, and the engineer's office would have to approve the modified design. Other options could, could exist, such as allowing, allowing the vacate request and not, and not allowing fencing across the existing alley section, but this would encourage public traffic on private property, as well as encourage pedestrian traffic along the railroad tracks. Another option that has been suggested is requiring a set of uh, gates to be installed. This option could be potentially difficult as determining who had control of the gates would be less than ideal. As the section of alley in question was platted but never constructed and no improvements have been made to the 10th Avenue right-of-way and the railroad holds an, holds an easement over the right-of-way, which would appear to prevent any improvements, staff, do, um, staff does not feel the section of alley in question is needed by the city and that vacating the alley would not appear to have a significant negative impact on the area. Therefore, staff does recommend the approval of the vacate request. I would follow that up, but I did get a hold of um, representatives of the railroad um, and, and speak to them late Friday. Um, they, they did note they believe there wasn't, they, they believe they do hold an easement over that entire property. Um, they weren't able to give the documentation of that right away. Um, but they did note that as they hold an easement, they would not want anybody to have access. They would prefer the entire alley um, be fenced off to prevent anybody from cutting through and walking along the railroad tracks. Um, they are aware that there is, you know, crossings that exist now and they're okay with those, but they don't want to encourage anybody um, operating either vehicles or walking along the railroad tracks. So they also noted because they do hold an easement, um, the railroad easements are gener generally difficult to work around that it is unlikely they allow us to make, make any, any improvements to that portion of the 10th uh, Avenue right away. And on my, I know you have the drawing. Oh, Can hold you on a discussion. Just going to have you point out something for people. Oh, sorry. oh I'm sorry. Just I just wanted to make sure we didn't get it. I just wanted you to point out where the new lot would be so people oh, understand uh, that. Oh, which way? This drawing right here? Yeah. The air photo. The air photo. Oh, it's easier to pick it out. Yeah. We're dealing with this portion right through here. These are the two residential lots. And this is the portion of the alley that would be potentially vacant. The rest of the alley remains open. It's just the rest of the alley would remain open. Okay. So they have access to the back end, the back area. All right. Thank you, sir. Um, but stand by. I suppose there's probably some more questions. Out of the I'll uh, open the public comment for anyone that would like to come up to the podium and state your name and address for our records uh, for comment on this alley. Okay, good evening. My name is Hugh Jack, and I live at 933 Saddle Street. And uh, I don't have a problem with the development of these two lots being turned into a parking lot. What I have a problem with is restricting an, an, an easement that now exists for emergency vehicles to access the back of our property in case the 11th Street side of the alley was to be blocked by either trees, a stalled vehicle, or some other unforeseen circumstances. In effect, if you put a fence across the railroad side of Block 30, it would be a closed alley, and emergency vehicles, power company, utility vehicles would not be able to access the back of our property. So my solution is, is that they can go ahead and put a parking lot in there, and they can put a fence in there. As long as you put an opening in that fence big enough for emergency vehicles, utility vehicles, to access the back of our property from that side if they need to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else on that topic? Thank you. Oh. Uh, 
Um, my name is John Dalt, and I live at uh, 924 Lockwood Street. And I'm in total agreement with you about the need to keep, at least keep the, that end of the alley open for emergency vehicles. And I'm wondering if there is a compromise in that anybody, you know, because I know I have neighbors who use that access, um, if it couldn't be left open where they could enter through St. Anne's parking lot and still get access to the alley. Um, I think that would go a long way to solve a lot of difficulties that um, some of my neighbors are having um, because there are people who use that entrance to the alley. So, thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Robert Westenbarger, 928 Lockwood Street. I'm one of his neighbors that does use the alley there, and you can see on the map there, apparently for the past 100 years those two tracks there have been used before the church acquired it. Um, the railroad company owned them prior, and we were totally unaware of this happening. And apparently, uh, I was told earlier that Kent Street there, there is a public access to the alley there, or not now, you're saying? There is a public roadway for Kent. To the best of my knowledge, there are there are no permits, and the railroad does own an easement over top of that uh, public right-of-way. There's no permit, but we can still maintain it, right? You don't have any, uh, anything to maintain it. And it's, we haven't made any improvements, and the railroad will not. But it's still drivable now. You can't drive down it, they're, they're saying you can't drive down it. Driving down, driving over a railroad easement, I uh, believe the final board. I'm alongside it. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I'm not, but, I'm not sure, but from what I understand of the easement, if you drew, drove alongside of it, you'd probably be on a private property. <clears throat> See, with public access that we were told from the city engineer's office downstairs last week must not exist. Then it was a public access that we were told we had coming down to the alley. Maybe, maybe that looks I don't know that public access always means that the public has access. I, I'm going to go out on a limb. Our engineer's not here, but public well, access Steve doesn't mean that, that any resident can drive up and down it. It just Steve. means that the city has. Want to come up? We've got, a, we've got the, the platted, there's platted streets all over town that are wooded, that are unimproved, that we certainly don't encourage people driving down. Um, this this easement also it, it's strange, but this easement also our, our right of way has an easement over top that that's railroad easement. If we do anything, there, it has to be okay by the railroad. Um, those those blocks that we did on tenth before we had to put in double curb with no crossings in the mid block. That's that's one of the issues I see with this is that if we ever did improve that road for some reason, there would be no mid block crossing. So you would only come into the alley one way. You couldn't cross it, much like those other sections along there. There's no crossing when you get across the track to get to the alley. They protect the railroad tracks with sure. the curb. Sure. Um, and that was that was something that they, they made us do because they hold that easement in their their easement kind of rules over the improvements to that road. And there there is, I mean it's platted, yes, it's platted right away, but there's also that easement, that railroad easement that exists on top. Thank you, Steve. So my concerns are the same with fire utilities. I have a back garage that sits one, one, well, two houses in off of 11th right there. That has pretty much always been based on that alley, accessing the alley, a drive through alley. So you see what it does to me if they block that off, coming through with a boat or um, trailers or anything in the foreseeable future. So thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Hi, my name is Joel LaFave. I live at 248 West Washington. I own a property at 913 Sabo. 
we've accessed that alley for about 40 years. Uh, I don't know what rules there are as far as maintaining that access if it became private property. Um, as you can see on the other side of the road, Crack St. Anne's has put their fence right up to the railroad on the 10th Avenue right of way. Is that going to happen on our side too in the future? To my knowledge, but, uh, they would have to stay on their property. So whose property is it now where the three trees are there along the railroad track? That the I, can't, I can't answer that right off hand. We well, if, you, if you stand there and look down the other way, none of the other houses have encroached on it. And the church has a fence right up to the railroad. So is that the intention on the other side? I did speak with um, the representative from the railroad and that subject was brought up. Um, we're not basically the railroad was not sure when that fence was uh, constructed it is their prerogative um the railroad's prerogative if they want to pursue uh the church to move that fence at this point they have not pursued that option and you would agree that that's between the church and the railroad not the city i can tell you when the fence was put in when they made the improvements on st Anne's parish hall there was a site plan that came to the planning commission <clears throat> those three trees there was a certain amount of setback off the railroad right away. On that side of the track from the center, it's 16 feet on the parking lot side. And back then, you gotta remember, St. Anne's was still going. You know, they still had kids there, so I'm pretty sure the railroad didn't object to them putting a fence along there just to keep the kids from wandering out onto the railroad track, like we did when I went to school. Mm -hmm. So that's why that fence was put up. It's not to protect the cars or anything just to keep the children that were still attending that school before they combine them all from wandering out on the railroad track. And that was done. Guys, that's got to be 12 years ago or so. So who owns the property now? St. Anne's. They own right up, St. Anne's owns the church, the bishop, whoever, owns right up to the, where the uh, railroad right away starts. So the city has already vacated that right away up 10th Avenue to the church? It's hard to say exactly in that 10th Avenue right away how where that where that uh, right away actually falls. You just look across the street, look across Lockwood, you can see where it falls. I can see where I see where 10th Avenue is built, but some sometimes things are a couple feet this way or that way on right away, and I, and I don't think they ever had any intention of putting 10th Street in there in the last 50 years they would have done. Well, we've been I think that's been used for over 100 years. Okay. And the the parking lot that they're going to build, I, I think it would be great but it's gonna sit empty at least five days a week. So to restrict us from driving across it, once it's in there, there'll be no gates on Lockwood or Sabla, it'll be a park, public parking lot. They can't restrict someone from driving in, right? Whether it's private property or not. Well, uh, they could, they're, it's their property. Could, but I mean, if they want to gate it off during the week or whatever, that's their choice. It is their lot. But if you vacate our alley, it's gonna sit empty 90% of the time. So why restrict it? I, I agree with the proposal to put in a beautiful parking lot, but don't block our alley off, please. Okay. Thank you, Joel. Okay. Anyone else? I'm uh, Father Joe Miskevich. I'm the pastor of All Saints Parish. Uh, behind this proposal and uh, I guess the thing that I concerned uh, it brought it was brought up Sydney mentioned it too um, was problematic part of who has if they did a gate who has access to that gate um, and which way is the gate going to go because you know if we're doing this for added parking uh, that's obviously going to if the gate was swung open there would be a time when we couldn't parking spaces would be lost uh, and then the other thing is of who has access to the lock um, on the gate and so I'm just bringing that up that that is problematic Thank you, sir. some years. I do a lot of lawn care for the people in the neighborhood. I do a lot of I use that access. 
there's no never been anybody says oh it's trespassing there's never been anything ever posted being no trespassing this is private property or you know no trust I, I do haul a dump trailer through there I do a lot of work well the thing is I'm worried about is like they, get, they build it up to level the snow removal system but they can have the adequate, adequate drains for the neighbors houses you start stacking snow we've been a dry neighborhood for years I can remember. I've never had a wet basement none of the neighbors I checked have ever had water in their basement but if they have some kind of a snow issue or a drain issue where they don't put the proper drainage in, all oh, where's that water going to go? I know uh, Joe's driveway, his, in the wintertime, his driveway is like a pond. Right? So that's just like a fill. But if you start bringing that up and it wants to you know, drain in, we're going to have problems. You know, we have problems with basements and also with the trees. Some of the trees I've notified power companies before, they're in the power lines, they don't do anything with them. And I know I talked to one of the people who plowed the alley out in, um, you know, Mr. Westenbarger has a boat, and it's a big boat, and he uses, it. he uses that to bring it in the back in his garage. Well, we're going to have to um, get permission from all our neighbors to use their driveways to pull on our, to pull on our equipment that way, so that way we can, we can get, we can access what we need to do. I haul a lot of brush out of my yard, and do the neighbor's yards. You know, it's just, it's a convenience is what it is. I've been doing that for 20, I've been driving through that, that little access right there for 26 years. You know, that's just, I feel that if they put a gate or anything like that, if we have to maintain that snow, you know, we have to keep that out. We have to keep the alley open. That's part of our job. And there's not really anywhere to push it. We start pushing it to people in the backyards. They're going to have issues with logging and everything else too, even with the snow blowing. So, um, I like to see it kept open for, you know, for the neighborhood for the people in that area. We help each other out. It's not one same single time I've told anybody, no, I won't, won't help you out. <coughs> Thank you. My name is Fred Bozinski. I'm the maintenance supervisor for All Saints Parish. Uh, Joel was talking about the water issue. The way the design was drawn, the water will go up to the curb and run down to the storm sewer. And we have a loader in our parking lot because we're tight for space and that snow will be moved out. You know, it won't sit there and melt. And if it does, it's gonna run to the curb, you know, not into the grass. Because the parking lot's gonna be sloped from the railroad both ways. So. Thank you, Greg. Comments other than what was in our packet? No. <coughs> Excuse me. I'll close the public comment. Open it up for council discussion. Uh, I wanted to address the drainage, so I guess Greg did that, and that's that's addressed um, with the engineering department, I'm sure as well. Mm -hmm. okay. Can we ask Chief Forbush about um, accessing the properties in case sure. of emergency? Chief, do you want to come up and speak to that, please? It's always ideal to have access all the way around the building for fire, fire control. However, in most of the city, we can only access from the front with vehicles, and then we go up the side yards and, and around the back by on foot. Uh, so while it's nice to have an alley, there aren't alleys everywhere else, and, and we can't deal with that. Uh, obviously, whatever uh, council feels is appropriate. Uh, it is easier with an alley, but it isn't necessary. We can we can work around it just like we do the rest of the town. Mm -hmm. Chief, I want to focus a little bit um, because that seems to be the major theme here is the access to that end of the alley, and maybe that your counterpart on the on public safety might be able to speak to this as well. It's the, the it's private property. We're talking about private property, and I want to I guess stay focused on that because where the where the tracks are going just south of the just northeast of the cursor there on the screen, mm -hmm. that's private property. Even though it's been used for a hundred years, we're talking about you wouldn't 
what kind of access would you have to that if the church decided they wanted to do anything at all with that? It, it's, it's do you normally drive there. wherever you can? If it were there, we could in an emergency. I've never had a, a resident unhappy that we access something on private property in an emergency, but we can get around it as well. Uh, I did want to note that several people suggested the possibility of a gate and who would have access to the gate and so forth and so on. That may be a good compromise. We can cut the lock off the gate and get in if we absolutely have to. But again, we fight most fires from the front. Mm -hmm. I think, I guess the, where I'm going with how I'm seeing the whole thing is that it is, in fact, the church's private property. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and whether whether we, like right now, um, if we don't vacate the alley, let's just say that we don't do we don't do what the request is. It's still the church's property, and they could come tomorrow and say none of these residents can drive across our property. So therefore, there is no access starting where the cursor is because there's there is no drivable access on Tenth Avenue where the tracks are. So I'm, I'm just trying to get a feel for what we're approving. We're approving or disapproving vacating the alley. We're not necessarily approving what the church does with it. Knowing that they intend on putting a gate up is kind of a plus to us, but it's really not our business. Yeah, or offense is what they've talked about. Or offense is really not, I guess, our business. I just want to be careful as to what we're approving and what we're not approving. Yeah, I, I, I think there's also... I don't know if this is the right word, but it sounds good, so I'm going to say it, a conundrum right now. Right. That what you have is that people, this situation has existed, as they've said, for 50, 100 years, whatever. And nobody's really paid any attention to it because the land has remained, I don't know if there were houses there and they've been torn down over the years uh, or it's been vacant, but it's been there that way. And nobody has said anything and, and just and occasionally it's been used as you can see by the two tracks now because of this issue it's become much more focused that yes it is they a lot of that traffic is going over private property which they could at any time say no you can't do it anymore we saw this right downtown here when pnc suddenly when they changed their parking lots let me interrupt you oh. just for a second until we get I just want to have one conversation at a time. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Sorry. Where the, the nature of the parking lot changed and suddenly where other people would be, or in the past were allowed to use their lot, suddenly they weren't. And that was their right to do because it was theirs. They could do that here. The thing that it's focused is, I think, if, if, we, if you leave it unvacated and they develop the parking lot on each side and you have it come through, they're going to dead end into an easement that is controlled by the railroad. The railroad is saying, one, you'd have to have their permission, and two, they probably don't, aren't going to grant it because they don't want that improvement going along there. Uh, and even if you didn't improve it, what you're gonna do is suddenly get people cutting across it, and either the railroad's gonna come in and then say, no, you've gotta stop that, either by they'll fence it off or whatever, or if that two track exists, suddenly you're going to start seeing eventually, you could, because if people go both ways to either street, now you've created a cut through. And, and it's sitting on an easement that belongs to the railroad. And, and so it was all fine when, when nothing was being done, the land was vacant. Now somebody wants to use it. No different than if somebody wanted to build a house there. Well, now you can't cut across that parcel anymore because you've got a house. Same thing, it just happens to be a parking lot. It's kind of brought the whole issue to the front, but what we're doing is encouraging them, if we leave that unvacated, to drive down there and go on to an easement uh, to the railroad, which does not want that to occur. And so, in the end, you know, either way, you know, there are good, it's, there's not a good, perfect solution for this. Gates, I find, except It'd be fine if the only ones who wanted it were emergent, we needed was for emergency vehicles because they could have keys or like you said, they could cut the lock. But if neighbors want to use it now, who are you going to distribute the keys to? 
or how are they going to get access and it just becomes kind of an administrative nightmare so in theory it may sound good I think in practice it just doesn't work very well um, so now we're just dealing what do you do when you develop those and it now makes the alley and where dead ends into the right of way of 10th and that easement uh, the, the conflicts that you have you have something Joe you want that did you want to say something just just dealing with the railroad yeah. um, here and there they you know I have a feeling the reason they haven't said anything is because of how vehicles get there now it's across the private property what they really don't like is you traveling adjacent to their tracks on a regular basis to the public thoroughfare without protection of their tracks that's exactly why 10th Avenue was built the way it was it was upgraded so that there's curb against their tracks to protect them and um, you know, if everything were to go through and they were to fence those areas, you would end up with a very narrow area to, to you know, drive your car. I mean, we all know how narrow it is down 10th Avenue when we drive there. Um, and you would only have a one one way to go. You're not going to get a crossing on 10th Avenue um, uh, via the alley, by anything. The railroad has told us point blank for many years, we will not get any more crossings. Unless it's a platted street that's already there, that already has a crossing, we are not going to get other crossings. So you wouldn't see a crossing set up on 10th Avenue to get into the alley. So you would only have access from one side, um, and it would be a narrow access because it would be that you know curb to curb area, and you try and make that turn with an emergency vehicle. It would be, you know, it would be the, uh, the way to go. Maybe I missed it, but um, were we clear on where the gate would be if there was a gate? It would be, well, I guess uh, if north is that way, it would be where the curb is. It would be at the is. north end of, of the property, at the, of the alley. What would be helpful is somebody with a pointer? Right from the pointer, right where the cursor is. Yeah. Yeah. See, see, yeah, you'd be having what well, any gate would have to. The fence would be along here as well okay. in that area, along the property line. That's a requirement, anyways, to screen it from uh, residential. Either a fence, hedge, something has to be there. Okay, because that was my next question as far as the fence goes. Because again, I'm not really that concerned with the, the fence, and, and or am I? What are we approving? We're approving well, vacating. That's the all you alley. That's We're all approving we're vacating We're the alley, so the church can use the entire alley surface that's just grass mm -hmm. as parking lot, rather than having two separate parking lots with an alley that goes to that would go straight into a railroad grade that we can't that they can't use anyhow. Okay. So the fence part is what part of zoning or something. It's all right. Any parking lot bordering residential zone district is required to have private fences. <coughs> so the, the question um, that some have asked is, why can't we leave just this little tiny 17 feet area open and then fence along the railroad tracks and then basically have people cut through the church park, parking and access a public alley. Basically, then we're funneling public traffic onto private property. So in my I don't know if that's something we can do. I think the church would have a case in that case, it's basically against us at that point. Right. Again, the church and their property. That's currently our property, sort of. It's, but in the end, I, the way I'm seeing it is in the end, and I and forgive me, I understand what you've been doing all this time. I really do. But it's it's only because the church has been letting you. It doesn't have anything to do with, with what we're doing. Am I, am I right? Am I kind of happy? You're right. Yeah. I, yeah. You're vacating an, an alley that's, mm -hmm. that's bordered by two properties. People that own those properties are looking to have that vacated, not the entire alley, as I discover. What it's doing is it's limiting a through access, but they don't have a through access other than cutting through private property. So right. if you said no, no to the alley, the church could put gates and fences right. on either end from, from either street and restrict access to that and only open it up during their services. In the alley, still would they wouldn't have any inner road access that way either. So we're vacating something that's in the middle, and as far as fence, I mean that's up to property owners. It's like to me, it's almost like when you have a uh, 
a neighbor and talk to your neighbors before you put your fence up and work with your neighbors and say I can allow you access to this and, and so on so it seems like more of it's a it's an issue between the church and, and that neighborhood than it is council vacating a portion of that alley we're vacating a portion of land that's not used it's not used they're using private property as a planning commissioner um, I went into the site visit and I drove around to see if, if the fire department or the police department would lose access to any of these properties. And I also went down the alley and I felt really bad when I got to the end of the alley and suddenly I'm on a two track on somebody's property. I thought, I'm driving on somebody's property. <laughs> um, and, that, and I know that it's been allowed and that's what we've done, but it's still somebody's property. So, personally, I don't see an issue with vacating an alley that no one is using. They're not using the alley. It's this, the residents' fear of what happens next. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the real conversation, and maybe you guys have had it, is between the neighborhood and the church. Um, and I, I know we are allowing a variance for that parking lot to come closer to those residents than is zoned um, and was there opposition to that in the planning commission there, there wasn't um the public that did show up um, principally considered with the alley vacate um the, the owner of that adjacent residence has gotten in contact with us and she just wanted to make sure that we were um after the planning commission hearing we wanted to make sure that we were the church was not planning on touching the fence that was not uh, the church was not planning on going, um, moving her fence at all so at this point, she is in favor um, of, of the parking area, um, is, is what she told me. Um, and I, you know, I hate to give unsolicited advice, but it sounds like a very close-knit neighborhood. And, you know, to have this many people from one neighborhood come and speak, you know, is testament to that. Mm -hmm. This is a, a church entity, and I would like to think that those two groups could find some kind of compromise um, as far as the fence or the gate or public access to that. You know, our, our, the tough spot for us is what we are deciding is just the easement, or excuse me, just vacating the alley. It has nothing to do with what happens next. Um, you know, I understand that it's kind of led the conversation there, but I, I would really like to see the, the, the church invite the neighborhood in or, or vice versa and have a talk about you know, what can we do with this lot that, that's accessible to that neighborhood and uh, to kind of keep everybody happy. Um, and obviously, the church has been cooperative over the years and have allowed that pass through um, and you know you know I understand it's what you get used to you live there as part of what you do is maybe part of why you bought a boat because he knows he can get through there so you have a certain standard that is, has been set uh, but really basically out of the kindness or apathy of the church either the case so um, you know to make it clear when we decide on vacating the alley that's all we all we decide what happens next is between private parties. So I would hopefully like to see that conversation happen at least. Further discussion of the resolution. <laughs> I move to approve a resolution 2016-07. Second. Nielsen. I, I think I did. Yeah, you, you made this second. No, this no, no. What did you say the first, in the first place? Are you calling for my I'm vote? calling for the roll. Yes. Yes, okay. Thank you. Okay, all right. Noah. Yes. Sexton. No. Wallagora? Aye. Johnson? Yes. Okay, thank you. Next up is the city budget. Open public hearing for the city budget. Uh, report by the city manager. Uh, you received an additional uh, memo from Karen Hebert, uh, Treasury Finance Director. Uh, regarding two changes to the budget from when it was presented to you two weeks ago. The first has to do with the uh, uh, DDA portion of the budget. The, uh, the basic change had to do with the, uh, the fund balance 
and I believe uh, it went up a bit actually. Uh, so there was that change as there were some corrections made. The other one, a little more substantial, is in the, did it go down? Oh, okay. Oh. The other uh, is with the major street fund, uh, where by the time we had prepared the budget, it was after that we were in a meeting which had with MDOT that they gave their timeline for the Second Avenue Bridge uh, rehab. And we initially had, had projected that it would be over two fiscal years, the, the one coming up plus the 17, 18, into the summer of 17. Uh, in that informed instead that at least if their schedule goes the way they plan, that the project would commence uh, late this year, November, I think it is, after uh, going through bidding and bid, and, uh, bid award, and then uh, be finished by uh, in June so it would all fall within the the upcoming fiscal year as a result the numbers had to be changed money that we had planned for 2017-18 moved to 16-17 it does result as you can see in a less than sterling uh, fund balance for that fund at the end of the year but that's because again monies that were planned to be spent the following year fiscal year are, are now so it will look better after the 17 18 fiscal year because we'll have revenue coming in but we won't have that large expenditure uh, as well so uh, hopefully things will all balance out in the end that's the only other change um, with that um, staff is recommends to council that they uh, approve the budget as it is presented with these changes uh, and including the uh, water and sewer rates that were presented actually two meetings ago and then also again discussed at our last meeting. And so that would be the staff recommendation. A real quick question on the bridge. Oh, wait. Yes. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, oh. oh, sorry. oh, oh we have to. Sorry. Yes, I'll be here. Open public comment for anyone that chooses to uh, comment on the. Budget, please come to the podium, state your name and address for our records. Any written comments on the budget? Okay, close the public hearing. Uh, now, uh, council discussion, sir. Sorry. Um, now, we put that money for the bridge back into this year. Yes. Yeah. And then it gets delayed. And and we'll next just, year, yeah, we'll just, just if, if for any reason it takes longer, the money will be carried over into the next fiscal okay. year. That's what we'd have to do. But right now, uh, it is looked at to be done in this fiscal year. That would be ideal because it means it's not dragging it out to longer during the summer. If we can, if that bridge is done by around mid June or whatever, second, third week, that would be, you know, before the 4th of July would be highly desirable. So that's obviously what. I think MDOT's goal is as well, and trying to be more aggressive with that. I think the uh, only thing I made council aware of last time that we spoke on this is that I was interested if council was of uh, pulling out the water and sewer rates as a separate vote, or we can leave it if council wasn't in favor of doing that and we can just vote on the budget. But with that being said, let me compliment Greg and, and Karen and the rest of the staff on putting together again uh, what I thought was a really good sound budget other than you know that one item that I discussed I thought everything was uh, well put together the dollars were stretched very well and uh, I just wanted to express my personal appreciation for the hard work I mean uh, I'm amazed that we've got as many projects in the budget with the funding that we have as we do so uh, my thanks to all of you I am um, I guess just in the event that goes to a motion that I'm really not, that, that I don't have an issue with leaving both uh, the water and sewer and the budget as one. Um, I I'm just I just assume vote together, but if enough want to pull it, then by all means. Um, uh, I would uh, echo that. It was a great job by the, by the department heads and Greg and everyone to get this together. I still have reservations, and I've discussed them with Greg a, a few times and with you, of the $30,000 towards the River Center. Um, obviously, that's not money directly spent at this point but set aside um, the, the group is going to come in at some point during the summer and give us a presentation of where they're at that might may or may not make me feel a little bit more comfortable 
I'm just not sure. And I'm glad that it's kind of just being set there right now because I don't want to be the council that gives someone something and then pulls it back next year. And I don't want to be the council that puts something there and then the next out of reservation like I am. And then um, in the event I'm not here, all of a sudden says, oh, that money was in there. So let's put, let's move that to a fund of our own. And all of a sudden it becomes something a little bit different as time changes. So I just, I have my reservations as to whether we have room for $30,000 towards a building that I understand past its, past its study for uh, feasibility, but was the question asked during the feasibility, would you like that or $30,000 worth of road improvements and lawn and leaf pickup? So I'm just, I'm having mm -hmm. trouble balancing where I want to put that. So um, I did talk to Greg and I'm, I'm comfortable with it in the budget as it is right now, as long as everybody doesn't come and and get all crazy with me when I vote to pull that back out and spend it on something that I feel is just a little bit more pertinent. It, as I said to the mayor, the money is set aside. It was money was set aside previously and was withdrawn. Um, I had even indicated that I had thought about ways where the money could not be withdrawn if it was <laughs> budgeted. And I had that all planned but said, no, we're not going there. What it, this does is it gives an opportunity for the Wildlife Sanctuary, uh, uh, the River City uh, Board or Committee, to come before the council, give a status report, mm -hmm. tell you how they're going to plan on building it and then operating it, and then have a dialogue and hopefully make you feel comfortable. If you do, you know, the money's there, you'll leave it. Maybe you'll add more money in next year, maybe not. Uh, if you don't, I mean, the money could be taken back, I, I assume, by the council at any time, uh, they, by amending mm -hmm. the budget, uh, or at the next budget, you know, make that change and saying we're going to remove that and we're not adding it, as happened in the past. Um, I know it's not good for them as a yo-yo, as but I just think at this point, uh, my recommendation would be to leave it in let them make their presentation and now the onus is on them and Adam as their staff that works with them very closely uh, uh, to, to, to convince you and that this is a feasible project not only to build but to maintain and operate without it being a drain on the city because that's always been a discussion since I was involved is that we had to sell it to council that this was not going to be a drain on city budget. You can't guarantee things always can go wrong, but that we're not doing what we did with the the old ice arena, putting forty thousand a year in uh, the civic center. We weren't putting a subsidy to operate, but we had huge uh, capital costs that were that were pending. That if we kept the building, so those are things that councils in the past, and I think some of you have indicated as well you don't want to go down that route and I understand that <coughs> I believe they understand it as well just had a, a couple quick comments and one thing I noticed in the budget is that we continue to try to contribute to organizations like Community Society and MACNE and CBB and um, well, I was happy to see instead of kind of pitting us and saying well we need to get rid of one of these that staff was able to just kind of take a little bit away from everybody um, and still enable you know those groups to get funded with our support so I appreciate that um, I, I was to have the debate but I'm happy to see the money for the River Center uh, <coughs> so yeah I kind of tie that together with some of these, these community projects that we have been supportive of um, and as Mike said I mean you guys do a great job every year and uh, the 10 years that I've been here have a goal of a, a pretty healthy fund balance uh, and at the end of the year I, I'm pretty sure every year we've been we've had more uh, that you know the staff's been able to, to come in under budget not over budget we've been able to have a bigger fund balance than we planned on not a smaller one so um, and that's not a credit to, to any of us as a credit to, to staff to be sure um, on the on Mike's suggestion on the, the water rates I I don't care either way. You guys want to pull them out and vote separate? Fine. When we're late together, that's fine too. So, um, but again, I, 
when I first came in, I was going to find hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? We're going to save all this money. <laughs> I remember sitting here the first time saying, why do we need 300000 for a water tower? What's wrong with you? Uh, but you know, what you find, and in, uh, certainly encourage the community to look, that almost all of our money goes to basic services of the public. It goes to a uh, few public groups and it goes to staff um, and so it's not a the city government is certainly not a money-making entity but I think we do great with what we have I think the number of grants staffs able to bring on really helps us stretch the money that we do have and um, then obviously the community involvement um, and what so many private people and, and organizations bring you know those three things together helped us improve the community with with not a lot of money so and congratulations once again, and good to see you. I guess I'll make one comment that as, is look, as we're estimating right now, the, the current year, we are looking still that I think it's going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of a $200,000 shortfall, which will come out of fund balance. Right. We have had years where we projected a negative and have come out ahead slightly, or very minimally in, you know, in the negative, where we had to take fund balance. So it does vary from year to year, but uh, we still have a healthy fund balance around 22% projected at the end of this current upcoming fiscal year. Uh, but we know we can't keep operating under the under a, what I call deficit. It's really not that because you can't have a deficit budget, but in essence, pulling out a fund balance all the time. Uh, we keep looking that some of our revenues will improve. But they're the things we really can't control. We can't control the property uh, values, and especially with uh, Proposal A and, and the Headley, they really restrict. Once they fall up very fast, they can only climb back very slowly. Uh, revenue sharing is always kind of a crapshoot. And now personal property tax reform is certainly, uh, and I'm not, this isn't just me talking because I'm on the city manager's list serve and it's all over. They don't know what they're actually going to get out of this reform. Uh, the state likes to keep saying you're going to get everything back. And I don't know of any city managers or township supervisors or uh, uh, village managers who believe that. And I very much in doubt myself. So how much we get, it, we're still waiting to see. I heard they just gave an extension for the businesses who have to apply or send in a form to the state, which makes them exempt, but they still have to list how much, you know, what they have in personal property. Uh, they There's a bill going through to extend that for another month or so. Uh, because, uh, once they missed the due date, which I think was in, at the end of February or something, and I'm going to get to the end of May. So. Uh, that one's going to be a big unknown. It'll be interesting to see what happens in the, by the end of the year when we should be getting the, the reimbursements. Um, I would like to add that I echo what all of you have said. Uh, certainly, I don't know of anybody who works any harder than city staff. And um, every single year, there are awards at the state level for Alpena, and those those things are caused by the staff, those kinds of awards and hats off to all everything Alpena. And I certainly appreciate it. I'm always glad when I go to MML or anything else and represent Alpena, I'm always proud of, of what we've accomplished and of what we do. So thank you very much. And I think Council's aware of my vote and where it will land and you know what my, my displeasure was with just in the capital look. Uh, the capital improvement to 20 cents per, per thousand on that. I didn't think that was necessary at this time. Um, as far as the operations and maintenance charges and those up charges, um, I went through them. You know, I concur with everything that, you know, Rick was putting out there necessary. I was definitely a yes for me on those because what hurt us in the past, in my opinion, was not keeping up with those operational expenses and they cut into capital. So I was for those but for additional capital outlay at this time, it was a, a no for me. So when that vote is recorded, I want staff and council to be very clear in why there's a no vote. That would be up to council. Yeah. 
you know, that. Well, you need a motion. You need a motion. We would have to move it. Yeah, second in a vote. So I move that we separate the, the water and sewer rates out of the city budget for a separate vote. If I said that correctly, go. <laughs> That's fine. Second. Thank you. And I'd argue, I guess, before we vote that, that I'm fine with that. It gives it gives Councilman Nowak an opportunity to to vote to to vote separately. So there is an understanding in the record later that 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 was his issue, and, and that's fine. I appreciate it, Council. Okay. So separate the sewer and water rates out of the budget. Uh, for a separate yeah. vote. Okay. Um, Nowak. Yes. Sexton. Yes. Walagora. Aye. Johnson. Yes. Nielsen. No. I could make a motion to accept the water rates. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I'm going to make that motion. Mr. <laughs> Let's do that one first if everyone's okay with that. If someone would move to. Well, nobody wants that popular <laughs> motion. Yeah. Um, I move that we accept the water rates, water and sewer rates as presented. Sexton? Yes. Walagora? Aye. Johnson? Yes. Nielsen? Yes. Noah? No. Thank you. You should have said yes, just because. Yeah, no, 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 just to make it interesting. Okay, uh, a question for Bill. Um, they now have three uh, resolutions to adopt. Um, well, but this, no, we the got, budget adoption. We got this, this. In there. So now that that well, yeah. well now what my question is since those contain these the water rates they have passed can they still adopt them as they are with the water rates since they were approved yes okay so so you can go ahead with the three motions okay I without effect. I was just wanting to make sure it didn't yeah. that we don't need to change the words yes now. yeah okay. that it affected okay. the mo the motions well, because right. it passed it's still right. in there okay. yeah, it is still in there. So next up would be a motion to adopt the resolution for the fiscal year 2016-17 budget because of adoption. So moved. Number second. Second. Okay, Walagora? Aye. Johnson? Yes. Nielsen? Yes. Noah? Yes. Sexton? Yes. Fiscal year 2016 17 appropriations resolution number 16 05. And will we approve 2016 05? Second. Johnson? Yes. Nielsen? Yes. Noah? Yes. Sexton? Yes. Walagora? Aye. And the last will be to adopt the amended 2015 16 in the city budget. So moved. Second. Seems like cheating. I know. Okay. Um, Nielsen? Yes. Noah? Yes. Sexton? Yes. Walagora? Johnson? Yes. All right. Thank you all. Right. Next up, report of officers, bids for ballistic vests for the police department. Chief is on his way. First part of this year is the Department of Research and examines several models of NIJ-06 uh, compliant <coughs> ballistic vest from various manufacturers. Uh, industry uh, standards part and manufacturer warranties are part of the retirement of ballistic vests every five years. And currently the department's inventory is due for replacement. The Razor Generation 2 ballistic system, that be a model RZ-RG2-A-2, by Armor Express was subsequently selected. The product is manufactured locally, I guess regionally, in uh, Central Lake, Michigan, and is touted as one of the most flexible NIJ certified armors available. Uh, several officers had the opportunity to examine the vest and agreed it was lightweight and pliable, and the current NIJ-06 uh, standards indicate that new level two vest provides the same protection as the older level 3A. As such, the level two armor offers better comfort without compromising officer safety. 
Uh, the request for sealed bids was advertised on the city's website on April 12th, and several vendors, vendors were also contacted. Two sealed written bids were received by the state at 2 p.m. deadline on April 26th of this year. The quotes were as follows. Uh, vendor uh, CMP Distributors out of Lansing came in with a unit price of $740 for each vest for a total of price for 17 vests of $12,580. The second bid received was Kessler uh, Police Supply out of uh, Jeffersonville, Indiana at uh, $885. Uh, and 67 cents per unit or total for 17 vests, $15,056.39. Uh, the 2016-17 budget for uniforms ha uh, will have sufficient funds for the purchase. Additionally, as part of the federally funded Bulletproof Best Partnership Program, the city is eligible for 50% reimbursement, which we did five years ago when we got 50% back of the cost. And I've already applied for the for the uh, grant because it has a very narrow window of application at the time. Uh, so it is there for my recommendation that the city purchase the best from CMP distributors at a cost of $12,580. Each package will include a pair of list of panels that's front and back, uh, two carriers as with the, the panels going, and a trauma plate that covers the, uh, the vital organs. Any questions? I yes. do have one question. Yes, Is there a difference in the performance of um, the $740 vest and the $885 No, it's, it is the no. same vest. We spec out the same vest. And, okay. And so when the distributor came back at $740 and the other one said they sold to us at $885. Excellent. 50% back? You can't beat it. I said and with 50% back, you can't beat it. So we're, we're optimistic. What do you do with the old ones? Yeah. A um, couple different things. Uh, we can't put them in service, um, but uh, we use them at the range sometimes uh, for ballistic testing when they go to the ammunition to sell forms. Because technically, they're probably still good, um, mm -hmm. but they just won't warranty the, the product. And so we were kind of forced every five years to have to replace them. Not a bad thing. I mean, they get, they get worn every day. They do get wear and tear on them. And, uh, but there's a couple of different applications we can use for. Chief, I'll say, I'll say one thing. This is a piece of equipment I pray that you never use anyone on the Thank force. You. You know. yes. mm -hmm. also pray that. Thank and you. that you always have top quality. Mm -hmm. uh, we start for the best. And uh, we can't skip on safety. This is mm -hmm. too right. dangerous to do that. So. And there's some days I'd like to borrow the ones you're ready to cast aside. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, there's a lot of paperwork involved in that. So <laughs> be careful what you wish. No, thank you, Chief. Appreciate it. Thank you. I move we approve a bid from CMP distributors for a total of twelve thousand five hundred and eighty, a unit price of seven hundred and forty dollars. Exactly. Yeah. Not on the easy one. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm yes. Sexton. Yes. Wallagora. Aye. Johnson. Yes. Nielsen. Yes. Yeah, everybody can keep yeah. so That's all we have time for, Steve. Wait a minute, you're insulting you're Steve. Steve feels not Steve. done. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Steve. You don't have to cooperate later. We'll stick they around. If they want to answer any other questions, they want a summary, it's too late. They had to yeah. change. Look at this. This is an amendment so we'll to policy statement number 56 <laughs> computer, email, and internet. You're on yes. stage, sir. Technology boards, everyone. Apparently, <laughs> 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 that'd be really good. He's still here. <laughs> um, the current computer use policy was established in 2001. It's uh, very detailed, containing 13 sections and 28 pages. And in being from 2001, it's very antiquated. Uh, there are many terms and software names that are not used anymore. And the worst part is that it's, it's pretty difficult to understand um, without some prior um, knowledge of technology. The Technology Committee uh, decided that it was time for an update and some clarification in the, in the policy. So I've attached the proposed computer use policy that will supersede the former policy and establish the guidelines for the usage and operation of city computer systems, email, and internet access. The IT committee has reviewed and revised this policy on several occasions. We feel it's a more concise policy that's going to be easier to understand and it should take us into the future. Um, many details were omitted uh, while keeping the purpose and intent of the policy clear. We feel that this is a document that can be read and understood by any user 
you ask users to sign an acknowledgement when they use, when they read it and understand it, and um, we feel they're going to be more comfortable doing that with this particular policy. Um, I'm recommending as IT coordinator that council approve the new computer email and internet pol usage policy, which will supersede the previous policy. And further, I will return to council at a later date to request approval on policies regarding virtual private networks, um, remote logins, uh, as well as city phones. Um, the other policy was very large and it kind of tried to encompass everything. And I thought it would be better to, you know, make this, these policies a little bit smaller. And I don't want anybody to think we're not also thinking about cell phone use and VPNs and things like that. So um, I want to make sure you know that we'll be going back with those as well. Excellent. Thank you very much, Steve, for cleaning this up. Somebody asked. Update. <laughs> You'll all be asked to sign it out. <laughs> so when you present, is it approve of council policy 56A amended or just 56? No, it's 56. actually it's I mean, a, a number. Okay. Yeah, it would be a new policy. It is a new policy. Yeah. I asked him a question. <laughs> I move we approve uh, council policy number 56. Second. Sexton? Yes. Walagora? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Nielsen? Yes. Nowak? Yes. I move we adjourn. Second. You are watching All About Alpino.